1969, the windmill at Lacey Green in Buckinghamshire looked to most people like nothing more than a heap of firewood, suitable at best for hens and pigeons. The oldest smock mill in Britain, dating back to the middle of the 17th century, was in such a state that even the experts declared it beyond repair. At best, archaeologists thought its wooden machinery might be worth removing to a museum, if room could be found for it. Fortunately, a handful of men and women with vision and imagination were moved that the windmill, a once magnificent structure that had ground corn for nearly 300 years, had all been constructed by hand with simple tools. Only since grinding corn ceased in the 1920s had it fallen into such grotesque decay. One man, Christopher Wallace, a civil engineer, had both the imagination and determination to see that it could be restored. Placing their faith in him, in 1971, a local conservation group, the Chiltern Society, reached agreement with the windmill's owners and leased it for 25 years. One misty October morning, with the generous free loan of a mobile crane, and there was to be a great deal of such help in kind, work started by lifting off the roof to give access to the rest of the cab. Many friends and curious onlookers turned up, motivated mainly by a quixotic regard for what was about to be attempted and to wonder that anyone should be so misguided as to try. The cap of a smock mill is the section standing on the top of the tower that revolves so that the sails can be kept into the wind, no matter from what direction it is blowing. With its contents, the massive brake wheel and wind shaft, it weighs some four and a half tons. Only with this out of the way could work be started on the tower proper, the weakened strength of which could only be guessed at after the ravages of time and weather, neglect and vandalism had all taken their toll. It was a delicate and nail-biting operation. Chris Wallace later admitted to shaking with fright as the great weight of the brake wheel and wind shaft was lowered safely to the ground. The remains of the striking gear spider dangling appendix-like from the shaft itself. One indication of the great age of the windmill is the construction of this brake wheel and its companion wheel, the wallower, inside the tower. It's known as compass arm construction, which, for the technically minded, means that the spokes are mortised through the faceted wooden shaft, unlike the later clasp bar which superseded it. A cradle had been prepared to receive this precious load, and many of the windmill volunteers, both craftsmen and clerical alike, were on hand and ready to guide their heavy burden into the safe arms of the haven where it was to spend the next six and a half years. Here, roofed and in the dry, refurbishment work could be undertaken in moderate comfort. The shed around it became the wrist workshop. With the top off, inspection revealed that the building was in a strong enough for work to proceed to the next phase, the straightening of the tower. Five months passed, and it was not until February 1972 that the next moment of truth arrived. One of the most alarming aspects of the windmill's dereliction was that the whole of the tower had slumped with a twist. This was because the cant posts, the supporting pillars at each of the eight corners, were rotten and had given way under the weight of the cap and its heavy timber machine above. If they could be repaired or replaced, it was essential that the tower should be returned to a perpendicular stance. Chris Wallace's plan for this was as daring as it was ingenious. Literally to pull the framework upright by passing a thick steel cable right round the tower, in this operation, some cant posts had to be moved more than others. His solution was to anchor the wire rope securely to the posts that needed moving, but allow it to slip through heavily greased notches in those posts that did not. 
The turfer rope winch exerted a force of five tons. It took two pulls, one to untwist the tower, the second to pull it absolutely vertical. This took a total of five hours, but here we're able to see it speeded up into the space of a few seconds. scaffolding, which had been promised free on what was known at the time would be a very long loan, was erected inside the mill to hold it rigid and outside so that work could proceed to the next stage. This was to strengthen and weatherproof the sides. The eight posts at the 135 degree angle corners of the main tower stand on a brickwork base and repairs to that were the logical next step. Not all the way round initially, but just for the first of the eight sides. So the work proceeded in stages, each one completed, proving the ability of the team and providing firm evidence as a basis for appeals for financial aid. Bucks County Council had already made a generous contribution and in February 1973, the Department of the Environment made a grant of 1,720 pounds towards the then estimated cost of three or 4,000 pounds in all. Of course, this estimate turned out to be only about half of the final cost, but it was still way below the £25,000 that a professional firm would have charged, even if one could have been found to do the job in the first place. Such was the confidence of all concerned in the safety of the structure, that as a way of further fundraising, and to increase awareness of the project generally, it was agreed in the summer of 1974 to admit the general public on Sunday afternoons to see the work in progress. This inevitably led to some conflict of interest between the society's publicists and the mill workers themselves, who had sometimes to be content with working out of the visitor's way during opening hours. Visitors were shown how the main strengthening of the structural framework would be achieved. For this, a durable plywood membrane, protectively painted, was to be stirred and concealed between two skins of weatherboarding so that both the inner and outer surfaces of the tower were authentic but would actually return the repaired tower frame to original strength. Labels helped visitors see what was being done. There were times when retention of the rope was just not feasible, though the approach used in the whole of the restoration was to retain and repair as much as possible of the timbers of the original structure rather than to renew them. As Chris Wallace so eloquently expressed it, it was our wish to retain the thumbprint of the men who had made the mill. It had all been made by men with simple tools who grunted and struggled to make wrought timber, and who had measured and made mistakes cutting the joints, but had finally succeeded in building their wooden mill nearly 300 years ago. Naturally, the Chiltern Society took the opportunity to attract new members. From now on, Sunday afternoon openings became a regular feature throughout the summer months. This took a support team of another 30 or so members, all dedicated to completion of the task their more active colleagues had so well in hand. Some of those early wardens are still at it today, 18 years later. Removal, refurbishment and replacement of the camp posts proceeded one at a time in sequence. As each one was removed, it could be inspected and assessed to see how much of its timber could be saved or would need to be replaced with new timber, scarf jointed onto the old wood. As both camp posts of each side were restored firmly in place, the plywood skin could be screwed down and the double layers of weatherboarding applied.
At times, when the whole of one side of the mill was taken off, a clear view of its four floors was revealed. Above the basement, the stone or milling floor, the bin floor where the grain was poured down chutes onto the stones below, and at the top, the dust floor with the beautifully carved main shaft topped by the impressive wooden toothed wallower, which normally engages with the previously removed brake wheel and transfers the wind's energy from the sails down to the grinding stones below. Renewed timbers would be fitted onto old wherever the original could not be kept. Second-hand floorboards from Paddington Station onto the original joists. There were times when in taking steel to wood, traditional tools were as effective or better than modern ones, or power tools. While each post was removed for treatment, the bricklaying had to keep pace with it, one corner ahead all the time. Each of the posts had to be secured to the brickwork base by a long iron holding bolt to prevent uplift when the wind blows hard. Each of these bolts had to be carefully replaced and firmly anchored into good brick courses. Strong tea kept the volunteers at their work, even when, as here in March 1975, their timetable and their ambitions required them to keep up the steady work on the camp posts, even though snow was falling. Neither cold nor rain could dampen their enthusiasm and their stamina throughout these long years. Almost every Sunday, week in, week out, was remarkable. Replacing the heavy can posts into position was an arduous and labour-intensive operation, requiring a good turnout of volunteers on the days when this was scheduled. In time, all the sides were back on the mill, and some attention could be given to the machinery inside. Essential to any mill are its grinding stones, the cutting edges of which must be sharpened or dressed, exactly so if they are to do their job efficiently. The lower bed stone must have an accurately plain surface so that when the minutely conical upper running stone lies face to face with it, a grain of wheat can enter at the centre and emerge as flour at the outside. The cutting edges all meet like the blades of many pairs of scissors. These cutting edges, set out in heart-shaped groups, are marked out in red ochre or rubble, and then carefully chipped away until the stone dresser is satisfied that each of the stones is true and ready for setting up on the stone floor. This mill has four stones in all, a pair of Derbyshire millstone grit for grist or animal feed, and a pair of French burns for milling flour for bread. By mid-1976, all the posts and strengthening cladding of plywood were in place, and work could begin on repairs to the machinery at the top of the tower, the mechanism on which the cap and sails are kept turned into the wind. This toothed iron track and inset wheels are part of that mechanism, and was probably introduced into the mill in the early 19th century when other repairs and improvements would appear to have been done. It replaced a similar but entirely wooden construction without wheels. Rusty nuts had to be freed before each section of the iron track could be removed. Most of the iron was cracked and broken, but was stitched together with steel fasteners by a specialist firm. One of the few whole sections was used as a pattern by Gomm's Forge and Foundry in nearby Loosley Row, who generously remade those sections to not be used again. Here the wallower is well displayed with its teeth made of apple wood, some of which would have to be replaced, but this time it would be with beech wood specially made by students of High Wycombe Technical College. After removal of the track, the heavy timbers of the underlying curb could be removed, section by section, and were found mostly to need renewal. Most of this work was done at ground level, for obvious reasons, but the exact fitting of the mortises and tenons 
was something that could only be done in zoo at the top of the tower. A great deal of marking, hammering and chiselling was required to fit each section firmly into place, ready to support the return of the cap and its very heavy load. In mid-1977, marking an accurate circle for cutting the curb to receive a 14-foot steel ring, like a hoop on a barrel, ended this phase of the operation. This was recorded on film too, but got lost by the film processing laboratories. May 1978, and at last, in reverse order, the components of the cab could be replaced. Same crane, same driver, that had lifted off in 1971. Just six and a half years in between, and over 6,000 man-hours of work, all undertaken by volunteers from many walks of life. Among them were a bank manager, two teachers, a lecturer, a television technician, an ex-Coco buyer, and a deputy director of post office telecommunications. To all of them, their vision was beginning to take shape at last. With the cap back on, and the whole structure beginning once more to resemble a windmill, the next step was to finish the weatherproofing of the whole structure. Apart from fire, water is the greatest enemy of a timber building such as this. If water can get in, it will dribble down the walls inside from top to bottom. Thoroughly dried out and seasoned weatherboarding, treated beforehand with preservative and laid over the stiffening plywood would ensure that this could not happen again. For the cap itself, a special aluminium roof was devised that would look like weatherboards but would be much more durable against the onslaughts of sun, wind and rain. Each board was fixed in place by stainless steel nails. Every detail had been designed to prevent water getting in, the approach being as thorough as its result had to be effective. Once all the work on the walls and the cap had been completed, most of the borrowed scaffolding could be removed and returned to make way for the most spectacular stage of the restoration, replacement of the sails. But first, they had to be made. It was a group of venture scouts, as they were then called from the nearby village of Flackwell Heath, who volunteered for the work and who pit-sawed all the sail timbers or whips in the traditional manner with the help and direction, as always, of project manager Chris Wallace. From this time on, these young people played a large part in making and assembling the sails and moving them around the site for painting and so on. Originally, Lacey Green Windmill had had two different kinds of sails, a pair of each. two common sails, each consisting of a frame of wooden slats, constructed with a special twist so that when covered with cloth, they would catch the wind like the sails of a ship and be driven around. The other two, added as an improvement in the last century, were so-called patent sails, which were fitted with Venetian blind-like shutters, operated by a system of rods and cranks, and were adjustable by the miller to suit the wind conditions but these were not to be replaced as part of this current restoration. Every piece had been treated with preservative under pressure and then painted. A restoration like this could aim for perfection. Its volunteers would settle for no less. Of course, just like their forebears, they did make occasional mistakes, but by trial and error, it was all coming right in the end. 
And so the great day dawned. Eight years after liftoff, on that misty morning in 1971, when all the pieces of the sails could be fitted back into place. They went together, like a Meccano said. First, the new stocks had to be inched up into the big iron block on the front of the wind shaft. It was a memorable time for all those who had laboured so long and with such dedication. Finally, in September 1979, the sails themselves could be raised and bolted, one by one, onto their masts, the stocks. It wouldn't be long before the volunteer army of workers would see the ambition of their years of toil fulfilled. At long last, with all its sails in place, the full glory and beauty of the windmill was revealed. All that remained was to set those sails in motion. The celebrated actor Bernard Miles, later to be knighted and to be in time Lord Miles, had always been a vice president of the Chiltern Society and had taken an active part in supporting the restoration project. He and his actress wife Josephine had personally raised nearly 500 of the windmill's actual cost of nearly 7,000 pounds by putting on two memorable performances back in June 1972 at nearby Hampden Bottom Farm. So what could be more natural than that the society should invite Sir Bernard to come and declare the mill open. This he gladly did, sharing the platform with Chris Wallace, who had masterminded the work from start to finish. And so, on the 23rd of April, St George's Day and Shakespeare's birthday in 1983, twelve long years since work had started, the sales of Lacey Green Windmill, that had been still for over six decades, once more sliced the air. And high inside the tower, those splendid wooden cogs of brake wheel and wallower engaged tooth by tooth to pass the wind's energy down to the working floors below. There, monitored by the newly restored governor which controlled their speed, the grindstones, so carefully dressed and reset, came into their own once more. Grain, brought from Jeff Hawkins' mill at Pitstone, tumbled down the chutes from the hopper above, to be ground to wholemeal flour. It was just as it had been in the days of the windmill's beginnings, over 300 years before. A truly noble and memorable achievement. <laughs> 